This episode of Space Time is brought to you by Moonshot, a podcast that explores the biggest ideas in technology and innovation and the people making them happen. You can subscribe to Moonshot wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, and lots more. This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 87. Coming up on Space Time. Dust rings discovered around our nearest neighbouring star. Why massive galaxies don't dance in crowds. And introducing the quark explosion. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a dust ring around Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighbouring star system. A report in the Astrophysical Journal Letters claims the dust ring's detection could point to a significant planetary system around the star. Proxima Centauri is a spectral type M red dwarf star, located about 4.25 light years away in the Alpha Centauri triple star system. It orbits the two primary stars in the system, Alpha Centauri A and B. Last year, astronomers discovered that Proxima Centauri is orbited by an Earth-sized terrestrial planet, since named Proxima b, which is located in the star's habitable zone, where, theoretically at least, temperatures would allow liquid water to pool on the planet's surface. The European Southern Observatory's ALMA Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope detected emissions from clouds of cosmic dust surrounding the star. The study's lead author, Guillermo Glada, from the Astrophysical Institute in Granada, Spain, says the dust ring discovery provides the first indication of what could be an elaborate planetary system in light of the Proxima b discovery. It means there could be more than just a single planet orbiting around the star nearest the Sun. Dust belts are often the remains of material that didn't form into larger bodies such as planets. The particles of rock and ice in these belts can vary in size, from the tiniest dust grains smaller than a millimetre across, right up to asteroid-sized bodies many kilometres in diameter. Proxima Centauri is quite an old star, similar in age to our own 4.6 billion-year-old Sun. And the dusty belts around it are probably very similar to the residual dust in our solar system's Kuiper belt, as well as the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and the rest of the dust filtered through the solar system that creates the zodiacal light. Now, the newly discovered dust ring shouldn't be confused with the far more spectacular disks of dust discovered by ALMA around much younger stars, such as HL Tauri. These contain much more material still in the process of forming planets. Proxima Centauri's dust ring appears to lie in a belt extending a few hundred million kilometres from the star, and it has a total mass only about a hundredth that of the Earth. The belt's estimated to have a temperature around minus 230 degrees Celsius, that's as cold as the Kuiper belt in our solar system. Interestingly, there are also hints in the ALMA data of another belt of even colder dust, about ten times further out. If confirmed, the nature of this outer belt would be intriguing, given its very cold environment far from a star that's a lot cooler and fainter than the Sun. Both these belts are much further from Proxima Centauri than the planet Proxima b, which orbits just 4 million kilometres from its host star. The apparent shape of the faint outer belt, if confirmed, would give astronomers a way to estimate the inclination of the Proxima Centauri planetary system. It would appear elliptical to us due to the tilt of what, in reality, is assumed to be a circular ring. Now, this would in turn allow a better determination of the mass of the Proxima b exoplanet, which is currently only known as a lower limit. The discovery suggests that Proxima Centauri could well have a multiple planetary system, with a rich history of interactions, which have ultimately resulted in the formation of a dust belt. Further studies could also provide information that could point to the possible locations of as-yet-unidentified additional planets. Proxima Centauri's planetary system is also interesting because there are currently plans through the Starshot project for a future direct exploration of the system with microprobes attached to laser-driven sails. A thorough understanding of the dust environment around the star would be essential for planning such a mission. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
A new study has confirmed that the rotational movement of a galaxy in a galactic cluster is determined more so by its mass rather than any galactic density. The findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal are based on a detailed study of more than 300 galaxies. The study's lead author, Associate Professor Sarah Brow from the University of New South Wales, says contrary to earlier thinking, the spin rate of a galaxy is determined by its mass rather than how crowded its neighbourhood is. To measure how fast galaxies rotated, the authors used an instrument called the Sydney AAO Multi-Object Integral Field Spectrograph, or SAMI for short, which is attached to the 4-metre Anglo-Australian Telescope at the Siding Spring Observatory in country New South Wales, west of Sydney. SAMI dissects galaxies, obtaining optical spectra from 61 points across the face of each galaxy, 13 galaxies at a time. The new findings run counter to previous studies made with a smaller sample of galaxies, which concluded that a galaxy's spin rate was determined by the other galaxies in its neighbourhood. Brow says the early conclusions were spurious. She says once you take into account the strong association with mass, there's simply no link between a galaxy's spin rate and its environment. We think that galaxies form when they're rotating. The stars in them are all rotating together. Like cars on a ring road, they're all going around together and that's how their shape is supported. And whereas there are some other galaxies that we see nearby, their shape is not supported by that kind of rotation. Their stars don't seem to be rotating all together. They're called pressure supported because they're all the stars are kind of, the shape is supported by kind of one star going one way, another star going the other way. And so Forth. And the question we had was how the stars move between that rotation, the supportive structure that we think they form with, to the slow rotating structure. And what did you find when you looked into that? We looked in a very specific environment of a galaxy cluster. So in a galaxy cluster, there can be up to thousands of galaxies. We looked in eight galaxy clusters and we looked at 300 galaxies across those eight clusters. And we found that in that slightly more dense environment that... Whether the galaxies were fast rotating or slow rotating depended on the mass of the galaxy. It also depended on the density of the environment, whether they were right in the center of the cluster, which is a very dense environment, lots of galaxies around them, or further out in the cluster where there are fewer galaxies around them. But when we disentangled using this largest sample, we could disentangle the mass and the environment. And we found that it was the slow rotation seemed to be much more dependent on the galaxy mass rather than on the density of their environment. That's different to what scientists previously hypothesized, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. In the past, scientists had thought that using smaller samples to do a similar analysis, they had only seen the dependence on the environmental density. So they thought that so if you see more slow rotating galaxies in the denser environments that that slower rotation must be caused by the environment being denser. With our large sample, we could split our sample and look at the dependence of both mass and environment. And using that, we could then see that the tendency for galaxies to become slow rotators seems to depend much more strongly on their mass rather than on their environment. How do you determine the mass of a galaxy in, in a study like this? So in this study, we use their stellar mass. By that we mean we're using the luminosity, the amount of light that's there to work out how many stars are in the galaxy. And we do that using, we fit a model to a series of luminosities across different wavelengths to get a picture of the stellar populations, the amount of stars there, which is subtly different to kind of measuring a total mass, which includes dark matter. That was my next question. We now know dark matter plays an important role in everything, but uh, in terms of the likelihood of a dark matter halo around each of the galaxies, galaxies or the galaxy mm-hmm. cluster as a whole, did you need to compensate for that or you just assume that each galaxy within the cluster would have its own dark matter halo? In this study, we don't take that into account so much. Um, it obviously comes into play. The galaxies we look at in this study are the lowest mass ones or a similar mass to the Milky Way, so kind of 50 billion solar masses, suns in weight, up to things that are 100 to 1,000 times more massive. And and that's in their stellar mass and the amount of stars. So, But those mass systems are known to have 
dark matter. And they're also, as you said, they're in a galaxy cluster and the galaxy cluster provides its own halo of dark matter. So we assume that's there, but in this particular study, don't take it into account much more than that. And to do the research, you use the Anglo-Australian telescope at Siding Spring. That's correct. So we use the Anglo-Australian telescope and a relatively new instrument on that, the Sydney AAO Multi-Object Integral Field Spectrograph, or SAMI. So the SAMI instrument was built around five years ago and we use that's integral field spectrograph and it's a multiple one so it can get spectra at multiple points across a single galaxy and it can observe up to 13 galaxies at once and so with this multiple integral field spectrograph we could observe many galaxies per night and so using the whole survey the SAMI galaxy survey is now up to around 2,000 I think galaxies that have been observed possibly more and we were looking at a specific subset of those. That's Associate Professor Sarah Brow from the University of New South Wales and Castro, the ARC Centre of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Scientists have discovered the quark explosion, a blast which could be eight times more powerful than any thermonuclear bomb. Fusing two subatomic elementary particles, known as beauty or bottom quarks, could result in the creation of a new primary particle, a secondary particle known as a nucleon, and the release of huge amounts of energy, some eight times more than a nuclear fusion reaction. In fact, the amount of energy that could be released through a quark explosion would be so powerful that the scientists behind the research, Merrick Kalina from Israel's Tel Aviv University and Jonathan Rosner from the University of Chicago, seriously questioned as to whether they should make their findings public because of its potential military applications. OK, so what's going on? Well, the protons and neutrons making up the nucleus of an atom are held in place by extremely high amounts of energy and splitting them apart in nuclear fusion reactions releases some of that energy. However, fusing them together to make even bigger atoms releases far more of that energy. And it now looks like the same thing happens on the subatomic scale. Quarks are elementary particles which come in six types or flavours, known as up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. Each quark has a different mass, all quarks have half spin, up, charm and top quarks have two-thirds electric charge, while down, strange and bottom quarks have minus one-third electric charge. It's combinations of quarks held together by the strong nuclear force, which is mediated through the gluon, which forms subatomic particles, such as the protons and neutrons often found inside the nucleus of atoms. And just because they're elemental particles doesn't mean they're tiny. The bottom quark's bare mass of 4.2 giga electron volts is more than four times the mass of a proton and many orders of magnitude more massive than any of the other five quark flavours. Now, when you think about an atomic bomb, a thermonuclear bomb, Each of the billions of individual fusion reactions deep within these thermonuclear bombs are fusing hydrogen isotopes known as deuterium, which is composed of a proton and a neutron, with another hydrogen isotope called tritium, which is composed of a proton and two neutrons. And this results in the creation of a helium atom comprising two protons and two neutrons, with about 17.6 mega electron volts as additional energy. Now, individually, that 17.6 mega electron volts isn't much. But when you multiply that by the literally billions of hydrogen atoms involved in the chain reactions of cascading fusion material inside thermonuclear bombs, the end result can be a 10, 20 or greater megaton weapon. What the authors found was that fusing two bottom quarks together generates some 138 mega electron volts, eight times more than hydrogen fusion. And that's quite scary when you think about it. In fact, the authors only made their findings public after determining beyond doubt that cascading fusion chain reactions of bottom quarks wouldn't be possible. 
That's because you simply can't make large stockpiles of bottom quarks because they only last for a picosecond before decaying into either an up quark or a chum quark through the weak nuclear force. The new findings are based on research earlier this year at the world's largest atom smasher, the 27-kilometre-long Large Hadron Collider at CERN under the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva. As we reported earlier this year on Space Time, the data from these collisions showed the creation of new particles known as doubly charmed baryons. These are composed of two charm quarks and an up quark. The higher mass of the charm quarks, compared with the more common up and down quarks found in protons and neutrons, convert a significantly higher amount of their mass into energy during fusion. The authors found the doubly charmed quark needs about 130 mega electron volts to bind. That leaves about 12 mega electron volts as energy, about two thirds that of nuclear hydrogen fusion. This was the first time elementary particles were shown to release energy through fusion, in the same way as previously seen through things like hydrogen to helium fusion. However, the fusion of two higher mass bottom quarks requires about 280 mega electron volts to bind together. But in that process, it would release some 138 mega electron volts, 10 times more energy than the doubly charmed quark. The authors now suggest it may be possible to study double bottom quark reactions by slamming packets of lead nuclei together in the Large Hadron Collider in future experiments. We'll keep you informed. Meanwhile, another experiment at the Large Hadron Collider may well be challenging science's very understanding of the standard model, the foundation stone of particle physics which explains the cosmos. The research at the LHCB experiment one of the four primary particle detectors positioned around the Large Hadron Collider has been giving some anomalous results that are really puzzling physicists. Scientists found a significant deficit in the number of kaons and muons being produced from the decay of bottom mesons generated by proton collisions. Mesons are highly unstable subatomic particles composed of a quark and its antimatter counterpart, the antiquark. Bottom or B mesons are mesons composed of two bottom antiquarks and either an up down, charm or strange quark. The combination of a bottom antiquark and a top quark isn't thought possible because of the top quark's short lifespan. Interestingly, the combination of a bottom antiquark and a bottom quark isn't a B meson, but a potomium, a neutral particle made up of a heavy quark and its own antiquark. Back to our story. Researchers found that B mesons were decaying into kaons and muons at a rate about 25 times less than what's predicted by the standard model. And that's important because the decay of unstable subatomic particles should occur at very specific rates. Now, although this failure could simply be due to a statistical fluctuation, excitingly, it could also be something previously unseen in B mesons, such as new particles. These new particles could be things like leptoquarks, hypothetical particles that carry information between quarks and leptons, allowing them to interact. By the way, leptons are elementary particles such as electrons, muons, taus and neutrinos. If the unexpected decay rates are signs of new particles beyond the standard model, it would open a new window on science's understanding of matter. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, let's take a break from the show now and bring a few words from today's sponsor. And today's episode of Space Time is brought to you by Lawson Media, the makers of the new podcast Moonshot. Moonshot's a podcast exploring the biggest ideas in technology and innovation and the people making them happen. The Moonshot ideas discussed on the show are about to change the world as we know it. Topics already covered include the efforts to go to Mars, the rise of AI or artificial intelligence, humans augmenting their body with technology, Terminator watch out, the bionic man's on his way, and things that have been especially close to my heart, flying cars and jetpacks. I've been waiting for flying cars and jetpacks since high school and they're still not here. Well, Moonshot tells you where we're at. There are also great in-depth discussions with entrepreneurs like Brian Johnson, who's invested $100 million of his own money to build chips that can eventually be implanted into your brain to fix problems that may even allow you to learn new skills or abilities in an instant. Moonshot's hosted by journalists Christoph Lawson and Andrew Moon and includes awesome theme music from Breakmaster Cylinder, who did the music for the Reply All podcast. You can subscribe to Moonshot on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, CastBox FM, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information, visit the website moonshot.audio. That address again, moonshot.audio. And we'd like to thank Lawson Media and Moonshot for supporting Space Time. And now, it's back to our show.
New research suggests that heat from friction could be powering hydrothermal activity on Saturn's moon Enceladus for literally billions of years, that is, if the moon has a highly porous core. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, are helping to resolve a question which scientists have been grappling with for more than a decade, namely, where does all the energy to power the geologic activity seen on Enceladus come from? NASA's Cassini spacecraft found that Enceladus sprays towering geyser-like jets of water vapour and ice particles, including simple organics, from warm fractures known as tiger stripes near its south pole. Cassini also discovered that the tiny moon has a global subsurface ocean beneath its icy crust, from which the jets are venting into space. And multiple lines of evidence from Cassini indicate that hydrothermal activity, hot water interacting chemically with rock, is taking place on the seafloor. And one of those lines of evidence was the detection of tiny rock grains, inferred to be the product of hydrothermal chemistry, taking place at temperatures of at least 90 degrees Celsius. The amount of energy required to produce these temperatures is more than what scientists think could be provided simply from the decay of radioactive elements in Enceladus's interior. Exactly where Enceladus is getting the sustained power to remain active has always been a bit of a mystery. Now, scientists have considered how the structure and composition of the Moon's rocky core could play a role in generating the necessary energy. Scientists found that a loose rocky core, with about 20-30% to 30% empty space between the grains, would do the trick. Their simulations showed that as Enceladus orbits Saturn, gravitational tidal forces cause rocks in the porous core to flex and rub together, generating heat. That loose interior also allows water from the ocean to percolate deep down where it then heats up and rises in the process interacting chemically with the rocks as it passes through them. The models also show this activity should be at its maximum at the Moon's poles. The average global thickness for the Enceladian ice shell is thought to be about 20 to 25 kilometres. The new computer simulation showed plumes of warm mineral-laden water would gush up from the seafloor, travelling upwards and thinning the moon's ice shell from beneath to between just 1 and 5 kilometres at the South Pole. And it's this same water which is then expelled into space through the tiger stripe fractures in the ice. The study is therefore the first to explain several key characteristics of Enceladus which have been observed by Cassini. There's the global subsurface ocean, the internal heating the thinner the normal ice at the South Pole, and the hydrothermal activity. Of course, this doesn't explain why the northern and southern poles are so different. Unlike the tortured and geologically fresh landscape of the South, Enceladus's northern extremes are heavily cratered and ancient. The authors note that the ice shell was slightly thinner at the South Pole to begin with, and it's that which would have led to runaway heating there over time. Previous studies have suggested the Enceladian South Pole may have been victim to a major collision event, big enough to cause fracturing and thinning of the ice at that point. The researchers of the new study have also estimated that over time, between say 25 and 250 million years, the entire volume of Enceladus' ocean passes through the Moon's core. That's estimated to be an amount of water equivalent to some 2% of the entire volume of Earth's oceans. The flexing of Enceladus's icy crust due to the gravitational tidal pull of Saturn had previously been considered as a heat source, but the new models show this simply would not have produced enough sustained power. The subsurface oceans of Enceladus would have frozen again within 30 million years. Although past studies modelled how tidal friction could generate heat in the Moon's core, they made simpler assumptions and simulated the Moon in only two dimensions. Whereas the new study has ramped up the complexity of the model, and simulated Enceladus in 3D. The Cassini science team had suspected for years that a porous core might play an important role in the mystery of Enceladus's warm interior. But it's this study which has included several more recent lines of evidence, most importantly that the ocean is global and that it has hydrothermal activity. Launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in 1997, Cassini arrived at Saturn in 2004, studying the Saturnian system, its moons and rings, up until 2017. Cassini has made countless dramatic scientific discoveries, completely changing our understanding of the Saturnian system. Not only has it changed our view of Enceladus, it's also unveiled liquid methane and ethane seas on Saturn's largest moon, Titan. It's provided a more accurate date for the rings on Saturn, finding they have less mass and are consequently younger than we originally thought. And it's provided new insights into the Saturnian system as a whole. 
The amazing journey of discovery which Cassini has undertaken finally reached its dramatic conclusion on September the 15th, when the tiny spacecraft was deliberately plunged into Saturn's atmosphere so as not to contaminate worlds like Enceladus and Titan, just in case they do contain life. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered one of the most distant galaxies ever seen, dating back some 12.8 billion years. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, provide new insights into the early history of the universe. Current cosmology tells us that the universe was created in the Big Bang some 13.8 billion years ago. The initial universe was filled with super-dense heated quark-gluon plasma, and it took some 370,000 years for the universe to cool down enough for the first neutral hydrogen atoms to form, in the process allowing photons of radiation to escape. After about 400 million years, the cosmos had cooled down enough for the very first stars, galaxies and black holes to form. It was their creation which started the epoch of reionization, ending the so-called cosmic dark ages and making the universe transparent consequently making it look the way it does today. The thing is, little's actually known about this distant time of the universe's evolution. And that's where this new galactic discovery comes in. It provides astronomers with one of their earliest opportunities to study this important epoch. The galaxy named G0983808 is the oldest object ever detected by the new Large Millimeter Telescope and the second most distant dusty star-forming galaxy ever found born in the first one billion years after the Big Bang. One of the study's authors, Min Yun from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, says at present there's only one other, slightly older, more distant object like this known. He describes these high redshift, very distant objects as being like a class of mythical beasts in astrophysics. Scientists always knew there were galaxies out there that were enormously large and bright, but they were also invisible in the visible light spectrum because they're obscured by thick clouds of dust surrounding their young stars. So, you see, paradoxically, the most prolific star-forming galaxies, and thus the most luminous, are also the most difficult to study using traditional optical telescopes like Hubble because of the very fact that their light is obscured by gas and dust. Determining the extremely high redshift of this object with millimetre waves has become a highlight result for the Large Millimetre Telescope, which can see through all the dust and gas by using radio and millimetre wavelengths. The new galaxy was first detected by astronomers using the European Space Agency's Herschel Infrared Space Telescope. But for such distant objects, the infrared telescope can only take very blurry pictures that yielded almost no information. So the Herschel astronomers passed their information onto the Large Millimetre Telescope team. The Large Millimetre Telescope is a 50-metre radio telescope located on the summit of a 15,000-foot extinct volcano in central Mexico. Astronomers determine the galaxy's distance by measuring its redshift, which is actually a measure of the expansion rate of the universe. The more distant an object is, the greater its redshift. To measure redshift, you use a spectral line of atoms or molecules, each of which has a recognisable, discrete signature of fingerprint. Historically, scientists measured this in visible light, but because you can't see these very old dusty objects in visible light, you have to do something else. In millimetre wavelengths, one of the most common and easily detectable spectral signatures is that of carbon monoxide, which the Large Millimetre Telescope was designed to trace. For independent confirmation of the redshift, the authors then enlisted the help of astronomers at the Harvard-Smithsonian Submillimeter Array Telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It was that triangulation which then allowed researchers to create the most detailed image of this new object and to confirm its high redshift. Adding to the picture is a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing, which uses a prediction of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity to bend or magnify, or in this case, lens light as it passes near massive objects. In the case of this study, a huge galaxy between Earth and the target galaxy acted as a gravitational lens, magnifying the light from the more distant galaxy. Astronomers say that as their large millimetre telescope increases in power, they're hoping to find lots more of these extremely early galaxies. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time.
SpaceX has just launched its 16th rocket this year. That's a new record for the Hawthorne, California-based company, which has now flown the Falcon 9 more times than any other launch service provider has flown any other rocket this year. The Falcon 9 blasted off from Kennedy Space Center Pad 39A at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida, carrying the Koreasat 5A telecommunications satellite into geostationary transfer orbit. Eight minutes after launch as the Falcon 9's upper stage delivered the satellite into orbit, the Falcon 9's core stage returned to Earth, successfully landing on the ocean barge, of course I still love you, positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. Stage 1 pressing for flight. T-minus 15 seconds, stand by for terminal count. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Vehicle switching downrange. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Power telemetry nominal. T plus 50 seconds in today's mission. We are on our way to delivering Creosat 5A to a geostationary transfer orbit. The nine Merlin engines of the Falcon 9 first stage. Falcon 9 is super Capable of putting out over 1.7 million pounds of thrust. About five seconds ago, we transitioned uh, to the supersonic regime. Coming up in about a second, we're going to hit Vehicle max Q. Maximum dynamic pressure. We actually just passed through max Q. That's one of the highest stress states on the vehicle. Propulsion avionics continues to look nominal. And back engine chill has begun. You heard the call out. The Merlin vacuum engine of our second stage has begun chilling in. Same process as the first stage, where we start to flow that liquid oxygen through that second stage engine. This first stage burn will last for about another 30 Recovery seconds. Has AOS. In about 10 seconds, we'll have main engine cutoff. All nine Merlin engines at that first stage will shut down. About three seconds after that, we will see stage separation, where the first and second stages will be separated by four pneumatic actuators, and then we will have the ignition of our second stage engine. We have Miko. Stage separation confirmed. And we have a good ignition of the Merlin vacuum engine for our second stage. Uh, our grid fins have also deployed. We use those grid fins to guide ourselves back through Earth's atmosphere to our drone ship, of course, I still love you. In about 15 seconds, we'll have separation of the fairing from our second stage. Back and we have separation of the fairing. It's a good separation. Second stage is following a normal trajectory. And we have a call out that second stage is following a nominal trajectory right now. Everything looking good. Meanwhile, first stage is continuing to guide itself down. We're coming up on entry burn at about the six minutes and 23 seconds for the entry burn. Now, in addition to using those grid fins for guiding ourselves back to the ship, we do have uh, cold nitrogen thrusters. Uh, we also use that to help uh, orient the stage back to the drone ship. Our second stage burn is going to last till about T plus eight minutes and 30 seconds. Then that second stage engine will shut down. We'll be coasting for about 20 minutes, uh, and then we will have our second burn to put Koreasat 5A into the final geostationary transfer orbit. Entry burn coming up in about a minute for the stage one. Uh, it passed through its apogee of about 110 kilometers. So now we are accelerating back to Earth. We use that entry burn to negate a lot of the, the vertical velocity that the rocket has built up uh, and help slow down the, the entry speeds. I'll see a more gentler touchdown. This entry burn will be about a 20 second entry burn. Uh, we're using a combination of one and three engines, depending on different timing and sequences of this burn. Today, there is only two burns since we are landing on the drone ship. We're not going back to uh, Cape Canaveral. So we just have the entry burn followed by the landing burn at about eight minutes and six seconds. Drone ship AOS. Stage one, AFTS has saved. Stage one, entry burn has started. Confirmation of entry burn start. 20 second burn. Stage two continues to follow a normal trajectory. Stage one, entry burn is shut down. And we have shut down of the entry burn. Expected loss of stage We'll have our landing burn in just about a minute of stage one. Single engine landing burn. Now we may lose signal, but we are getting the feed from a saddle in the drone ship. Uh, with that tropical storm moving uh, through the area, there were some choppier seas, which makes our satellite link a little bit uh, more challenging. But we will provide you guys updates as we have them. Stage, uh, stage one two. is transonic. The call out for stage one passing through transonic regime just came. Trajectory continues to look good for this second burn. 
our first burn of the second stage, which will have cut off at about eight minutes and 30 seconds. Stage one landing burn has started. The landing burn for stage one has begun, 30 second landing burn. We do have confirmation that we did have our second stage engine cut off. Uh, it does look good like park. we are in a good parking orbit for stage two. This is recovery, stage one has landed. Recovery operators bring the second landing. And we have confirmation from recovery operators that stage one has landed. Stage one has landed, a little toasty, but it is, stage one is uh, certainly still intact on the drone ship. Our second stage is in a good parking orbit right now. The 3,500 kilogram CoreaSat 5A was built by Thales Alenia Space using a Spacebus 4000 B2 platform. The spacecraft's equipped with some 36 KU band transponders, providing broadcast and internet services across Korea, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. The Koreasat 5A is replacing a faulty satellite, which has developed serious solar array issues. The new spacecraft is expected to remain in orbit for at least 15 years. As well as being SpaceX's 16th launch this year, it was also the 44th successful launch of a Falcon 9 rocket. And it's not over yet. SpaceX is planning up to four more Falcon 9 missions before the end of the year. The next flight, slated for November the 15th, will see it launch Northrop Grumman's classified Zuma mission. The flight will launch from Pad 39A at Cape Canaveral, with the first stage slated to return to Cape Canaveral Landing Zone 1 rather than the Ocean Barge. Zoom is being described as a black commercial mission, slated for a LEO or low Earth orbit. The flight will use a new Falcon 9 core stage, originally intended for use on next month's Dragon CRS-13 resupply mission, bound for the International Space Station. The fact that they've taken a core stage already planned for another mission means the whole thing's probably come about on short notice. As for the CRS-13 mission, it'll be the first to fly from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral since the pad's rebuild following a catastrophic explosion during the Amos 6 static fire test in September last year. The blast, which extensively damaged the launch complex, was traced to a failure in a Falcon 9 upper-stage composite helium tank used as part of the liquid oxygen pressurization system. SpaceX is also still hoping to conduct the maiden flight of its new Falcon Heavy launch vehicle sometime next month. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The United Nations World Meteorological Organization says 2017 is now on track to be among the top three hottest years on record. And it's all because of anthropological climate change caused by CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. Importantly, planet Earth's likely fate for 2017 comes despite there being no additional warming influence from El Nino. The other two years claiming the top three positions are 2015 and 2016, both years in which temperatures were boosted by an exceptionally strong El Nino. The latest report was released to coincide with the opening of the Bonn Climate Conference in Germany, where the World Meteorological Organizations warned that record-breaking temperatures are exposing people to worsening environmental extremes. In Australia, the states of Queensland and New South Wales stand out as being unusually warm so far this year, with some record-breaking temperatures recorded in spring. In fact, Australia is now over 10 degrees hotter than the global average. Farmers, firefighters, tourism operators and doctors are among those already dealing with the worsening impacts of climate change, including heatwaves, bushfires, flooding and coral bleaching. 2017 has also already seen record-breaking heatwaves in Chile, the Mediterranean, Southwest Asia and California, as well as continuing severe drought in East Africa and destructive floods on the Indian subcontinent, as well as an incredibly active North Atlantic hurricane season. Experts say the surge in global warming, while alarming, is not unexpected. At over 403 parts per million, global atmospheric CO2 levels are now more than 46% higher than pre-industrial levels. The World Meteorological Organization also says long-term signs of climate change, such as growing carbon dioxide concentrations, sea level rise and ocean acidification, are continuing to worsen unabated. Arctic sea ice coverage is still well below average, and the previously stable Antarctic sea ice extent is now also at or near a record low. Push-ups and sit-ups could add years to your life, according to a new study of over 80,000 adults led by the University of Sydney. The study, reported in the American Journal of Epidemiology, compared the mortality outcomes of different types of exercise. 
The authors found that people who did strength-based exercise had a 23% risk reduction of premature death by any means and a 31% reduction in cancer-related deaths. A new Swedish study has found that attempted suicide is significantly more common among people who were done badly at school at the age of 16. The study of over 26,000 people followed subjects up to the age of 46, finding that hospitalisation due to suicide attempts and self-harm was almost five times more common for people who were at the bottom 25% of their last year at school compared to those in the top 25%. The authors say it's still not clear whether people attempt suicide due to school failure or whether poor performance may indicate people who are vulnerable. A new study warns that wind farms and mountain ridges could wipe out bat populations because bats use mountain slopes to help them fly to high altitudes. The findings, reported in the journal Mammal Review, suggest that mountain ridges are key habitat features that help with foraging and navigation for some bats. For the study, scientists attached miniaturised global positioning system tags to cave bats near a mountain ridge in Thailand. The data shows the bats were repeatedly using the mountain slopes to ascend to altitudes of over 550 metres above the ground. The recorded flight paths suggest that some bats may be attracted to wind turbines when these are placed along mountain ridges, resulting in the ultimate decimation of some bat colonies. Paleontologists have been able to determine the colour patterns of a Sinosauropteryx dinosaur, finding it had a striped tail and a raccoon-like bandit mask. The discovery, reported in the journal Current Biology, is based on three specimens of the small theropod dinosaur found in China. The scientists, using remnant chemicals from pigments in fossilised skin and feather samples, also indicated that these dinosaurs were countershaded, meaning that their bodies were darker on the top and lighter underneath indicating they lived in more open habitats rather than dense forests. The findings show that in some ways at least, not much has changed in the last 130 million years. It seems dinosaurs back then were dependent on the same camouflage patterns that animals still rely on today. And finally for now, once again it looks like Absolutely Fabulous was right. A new study claims that today's teenagers have far less delinquency, far less substance abuse and have far more positive behavioural traits than what things were like when you were a teen. The findings reported in the journal Psychological Medicine are based on over a decade of data, showing that teens have become far less likely to abuse alcohol, nicotine or illicit drugs, and they're also far less likely to engage in delinquent behaviours such as fighting and stealing. The data comes from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, an annual survey of 12 to 17-year-olds from all 50 American states. The latest data includes information from 2003 through to 2014, the last year for which survey numbers are available. A total of 210,599 teenagers, 13,000 to 18,500 each year, were part of the study. Researchers found that the number of substance use disorders among 12 to 17-year-olds had declined by 49% over the 12-year span, along with a simultaneous 34% decline in delinquent behaviours such as fighting, assault, stealing, selling drugs or carrying a handgun. The drop in substance abuse among teens parallels findings from other recent surveys, but until now no one had looked at how the drop-off may be linked to other behavioural issues. The new findings suggest that the changes may have been driven more by changes in adolescents themselves, rather than changes in policies designed to reduce substance abuse or delinquent behaviour. Researchers also found that teens nowadays are delaying sex more often than their parents or grandparents did. And although heroin and opioid abuse has become epidemic in many areas, its use among teens has actually fallen, with a decline of nearly 50% among 12 to 17 year olds. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's 
Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. This episode of Space Time was brought to you by Moonshot, the podcast that explores the biggest ideas in technology and innovations and the people making them happen. You can subscribe to Moonshot wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and Pocket Casts. Moonshot. Check it out today.